Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. On this edition, we'll experience the life of a pioneer, visit a Minnesota state park, enjoy a music video about a historic grocery store, and listen to a popular indie rock band. In the 1800s, the railroads faced a problem. Farm labor shortages along their newly expanded westward lines threatened profitability. Not surprisingly, in 1853, they jumped at the chance to support a New York City minister's idea, an early version of foster care that would find homes for the city's orphans on farms in the Midwest. They were told, your parents are not your parents, your past is not your past, your life begins when you are chosen. The orphan trains began because a Methodist minister in New York City named Charles Loring Brace looked around the streets of New York and saw that there were 30,000 children living on the streets. They were getting run over, dying of starvation and exposure, going to jail, becoming criminals, they were becoming prostitutes. What we think of as Dickensian London is really what it was like then for poor people. Immigrants were pouring in, the Industrial Revolution was replacing jobs for poor people with machines. The Civil War was raging and creating vulnerable war widows. So there are many reasons that there were all these children on the streets. And Brace had this idea, it was sort of a glorified fresh air fund. He thought, if I can get children off the streets and send them to farms in the Midwest where labor is needed, maybe we can save their lives and maybe we can clean up the streets of New York. He worked with the train companies to send children on trains to the Midwest, and the trains each held between 10 and 30 children. And over the course of the next 75 years, over 250,000 children were sent to the Midwest. There were two ways that people got children from the orphan trains. The Foundling Hospital, which got into the act a little bit later, would put notices in newspapers around the Midwest and people would write in and say, I'd like a blonde, curly-haired, blue-eyed, seven-year-old boy with a sweet disposition. And so they would look around and find that child and put him on a train, and then that person would be waiting on the other end. The Children's Aid Society had the children line up by height at a train platform or at a city hall or a Grange Hall. Then farmers or whoever came would often, not unlike a slave auction, have them run in place, check their teeth, check their muscles, have them do even sit-ups or push-ups to make sure they were strong because they wanted workers. The farmers would take them off the stage and then fill out certificates taking ownership of the child. Contracts were signed between the people who took the train riders in and the organization, the Children's Aid Society or the Foundling Hospital, and it says, shall be indentured until the age of 21. These children were two to 14 years old. 21 is quite a long time to be working for someone else. The people who took in the train riders were required to send them to school, four months of schooling a year, to feed and clothe them, there was some language about treating them as you would one of your own. However, they were labor. For some of them, it was actually a form of slavery. Many of them had no choice but do what they were told to do. There were volunteers in communities who were supposed to check in on the children. That was rather spotty as a process. For one thing, they were volunteers. And because children were property, even if someone went out to check on a situation, it was much more likely that the adults would be believed 
than that the child would be believed. Furthermore, there was a great disincentive to take children out of homes because it was so hard then to know what to do with them. And so they would often leave children in situations that were not really the best for them. It was an imperfect system. And what it meant is that it was absolutely a roulette wheel. And the children had no choice about where they were going. And the people who took in the train riders were as varied as human nature. There were very good people, a very kind people who took in train riders, and there were also people who weren't so good and kind. Even if the people who took them in were kind, they often treated them as a little bit less than family. One of the reasons we don't know much, that most people don't know much about the orphan trains, is that the train riders themselves didn't realize that they were part of this large movement. A quarter of a million children go on these trains and most of them think that their train was the only one that went. So you can see why they didn't organize more quickly or reach out to each other. I was so lucky. When I began this book, there were 150 living train riders. Today, there are probably between 10 and 20. It was such a gift. I had access to living train riders and could interview them. One of the most significant was a woman named Pat Thiessen. Even at the age of 93, she felt the loss and the sort of sorrow. She said, they were good people, but they were not my people. As one train rider said to me, you know, we had been through so much turmoil and so much trauma. Every child who rode the orphan train had been through something terrible. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been there because the trains were the last resort. The Lake Country Mountaineers Black Powder Club gathers in Purim, Minnesota each year to celebrate the history of the fur trade era. Here you can find a first-hand look at how pioneers would have lived, dressed, and worked to survive the hardships of life in the wilds of Minnesota. Right now we're at uh, Purim at their Pioneer Grounds. I belong and am president of the uh, Lake Country Mountaineers Black Powder Club. It is a reenactment type situation where we're reenacting the fur trade rendezvous era pre-1840. In the 1840s, well, back then that's when the furs were plentiful and they were worth lots of money back then. If you got $20 for a hide, that was a lot of money. Then they, back then, they didn't really have money anyway. They just traded goods for it, unless they took them into a fur buyer where they actually bought the furs, and they do that once a year. That's what the rendezvous is, so once a year, all the fur traders met, and then they distinguished everything else from that point. In today's world, you can't imagine what they went through. The life they had to lead, the dangers and, and the hardship, to me, that's the most interesting part of it. We have uh, both modern and primitive camping, Modern people can come and stay in what we call tin teepees, or they're campers or regular modern nylon type tents. And in the primitive ones, we try to keep it looking as much as possible pre-1840. Well, our camp is called Camp Cotton because of the dog back there. Her name's Cotton. Well, we bring our canvas tents, bring our cast irons, bring our boxes that's got our trinkets and our clothing. You know, most of them come by here, they look at the doghouse, so the doghouse is a catcher for them, so. It's, it's something that families have hosted together for years. Moms and dads bring their kids, and kids start from early on. They, they start throwing hawk and knife and archery, and then when they get to a certain age, then they can have a firearm on the range under supervision. There's a lot of shooting going on today. 
Well, right now they're having the paper shoots and the primitive range. Primitive shoot, you get a five round shoot. Primitive is uh, like your flint locks, or your percussion caps. You know, with flint lock, you gotta put powder in your prism and close the prism and cock the hammer. And it's got a flint on your hammer, so then when it hits the prism, it lights the powder. Where a percussion, you got a little cap you stick on your percussion, and then that's what sets off your powder in your gun. The ones that we shoot have rifling in them. That's like one twist every 48 inches. So every four feet, you know, you get one twist in your rifling. We have a special shoot at this rendezvous where you can win a gold ring that was cast much similar to the way they did it back in those years. So that's, that's a fun thing because you get out in the range and you get some people out there shooting and you can have fun with them on the range. Our club has been around for roughly about 32 years. It's it's a coordinated effort. Every everybody pitches in. Everybody uh, works to get the grounds ready, and it's a team effort. It's a lot of work. It's all about learning and having fun at the same time. We are always looking for new members. We have a website called Lake Country Mountaineers or you can get a hold of any of the members uh, if, you, if you're at a rendezvous or know somebody or have an interest in black powder shooting and, and uh, competition. I've been involved with this club for slightly more than 20 years. So if you look at the color of my mustache and hair, you can tell uh, that we're looking for younger people. Alicia Curran gives a musical interpretation of Herman Fink the grocer in Wadena, Minnesota, who gave away live chickens for bargain days and created havoc in the town. Herman Fink was new in town. He built a grocery on the corner and settled down to bring in customers and make it pay. He offered free gifts for three Saturdays. At first, people crowded in groups and pairs, and the back alley crates climbed high in the air. When it was time, they asked all to stand by, and a hundred hens rained down from the sky. Feathers flew the chickens to officials, didn't know what to do. Young boys chased hens as they fist fights between tightly laced. Mrs. Brown smashed to the ground, two car windshields were knocked out. Ladies fussing, gentlemen cussing, and bird waste was everywhere mussing. That week, Fink saw the town's ire rise. He decided he needed a different prize. He replaced the hens from the week before with a bird he thought would be a better score. The customers thought they knew what to expect. They came with boxes to collect. But leghorn cockerels can run and fly, and pretty soon everything went awry. Feathers flew the roosters to officials, watched them take to roofs. Cockerels raised people, chased to find the birds and get a taste. There next morning, when every store on, and cockerels dropped their birdie warnings. Fink said people shouldn't fuss, but too many feathers had been mussed, and the people called for a Herman Fink bust. Though gentlemen sniggered and the ladies it triggered a new chicken safety brigade. Herman disgraced, surrendered his place, and gave up his bird-based scheme. Birds cooed and cawed, Fink hemmed and hawed, and finally compromised for the last week. On the third Saturday, Fink let down his fans, when from the roof it rained beach balls instead of bird contraband. No feathers flew, it was balls Fink threw. Officials had nothing to do. No birds misplaced, of fistfights no trace, and 
no one left what Dina disgraced. No ladies fussing or gentlemen cussing. No one wiping off bird mussing. What Dina settled back down to be a quiet town where boring is better than too many birds around. But we can still remember when. Feathers flew the chickens too. Officials didn't know what to do. Young boys chased hens, escaped fist fights between tightly laced. Mrs. Brown smashed to the ground. Two car windshields were knocked out. Ladies fussing, gentlemen cussing, and bird waste was everywhere mussing. Now Adina settled back down to be a quiet town where boring is better than too many birds around. On the banks of Lake Superior, the Civilian Conservation Corps left an incredible legacy in Gooseberry Falls State Park. The beautifully crafted stone buildings they built at the height of the Depression stand as a testament to the hard work and can-do spirit of a corps of young men who enhanced the natural beauty of one of Minnesota's most popular state parks. It's a great place to come in the summer and enjoy being by the lake. In the winter, we have over 17 miles of ski trails and snowshoe areas. And then in the fall, you can come and see the colors. The beginning of the land, about 600 acres, was purchased in 1933 by the state. And in May of 1934, the first CC arrivals came. And that first camp was located down here by the mouth of the river. And that fall, the first members of Camp 2710 arrived. And that was kind of the beginning of the park. They started making trails. Um, some of the buildings, including the one behind me, started being built. And Gooseberry has just continued on since then. It became a park in 1937. And today we have over a half million visitors who come throughout the year to visit us. I think life for the CCC boys was really good here. You know, they came, they felt they had a job, they were learning new skills, they were supporting their family, and it really was a community. It's, it's interesting to think about what it would have been like for them and uh, how close that these guys got to one another. We have over 80 structures here. So we have a lot of different kind of lookout areas, lots of stone switchbacks and stairways. And one of the biggest structures that they did was what we call the castle in the park or the gateway plaza. And that's where when visitors came, they could park at the top of that, come down to view the falls and there are restrooms there. And that they started building in 1936. It was the longest running project that they did. A lot of these boys that came, they were farm boys or town boys, and they didn't know the skills of masonry and logging and putting, you know, carpentry, putting things together. They had local men, they were called LEMs. They were men from the community that had the skills, and they would train these new CCC enrollees how to do everything. And there's even a quote from one of our enrollees who said, without these men, we would have been completely lost. One big project that they did was working on the picnic flow. And the picnic flow is this big, ancient lava flow of just basalt rock, but very beautiful, very scenic right along the lake and you get a good view. They built over 30 picnic tables, benches, grills, and water fountains. All of our stone stairways were CCC built. There's a water tower that exists here that they built, a couple of pump houses, their ice house, um, just their, you know, there are these little scattered remnants of everything they did and of their life here too. Winter on the North Shore is just something everybody should experience. The water itself, the lake, kind of takes on this new life formation. The waterfalls usually f freeze mostly and we'll get some really unique ice structures. And then we have ski trails, groom ski trails, um, snowshoe trails that are really fun to get out on and we do a lot of uh, winter programming as well. The neat thing about visiting any park on the North Shore and Gooseberry, I always tell people, you know, whether you come here and it's a 
rainy day and there's a big storm or something, Lake Superior always has something to show off, whether it's great big waves or just this large glass, you know, body of water. We're also very privileged that we have um, five naturalists during the summer season. So we're able to offer a variety of programs from guided hikes to guided accessible strolls on paved trails to campfire and evening programs. We're able to do a lot and do a lot for everybody and continue to do programming throughout the winter. Gooseberry has a really unique geological story. You know, it goes back from millions of years ago when the continental rift was created and throughout this whole area, lava kind of spewed out and cooled, creating these big kind of rocky basalt beaches that we have that's pretty unique for this area and for Lake Superior. And we also have not only one, but five waterfalls. So people can come and explore the two lower falls, the middle falls, the upper falls, and hike inland up about a mile to the fifth falls. We also have different trails that expand north where you can kind of get up over the ridge and start seeing some unique forest plants and some uh, different maples and different types of tree species as well. So, you know, Gooseberry offers a lot, whether you just want to enjoy being by the big water or you want to go and explore the woods as well. People who served in the CCC, when they were getting ready to close up camp and a lot of the enrollees were leaving the camp, one of the guys wrote, the thousands of people who will use this area in time to come may give us little praise for our efforts, but will little matter as long as we can justly be proud of saying, I helped make this park what it is today. Little did he know it wouldn't be thousands of visitors, it would be millions of people coming to this park. And you know, we have a CCC statue here. We do a lot of CCC hikes. We give them praise and we remember and tell their stories and how much their story is still alive today. Oratone is a four-piece indie rock band based in the Fargo-Moorhead area. Their organic sound stems from the velvet synthesizers that drive the inducing rhythm in their original music. Eric Bailey, the primary songwriter, has a personal connection to the music he wrote for the album Songs of the Red.
can take me down to the other side. You can take me up and down for the ride. You can take me down to the other side. You, you can, can see the lightning flashing side to side. You can see the lightning flashing there in the sky. You can see the lightning flashing side to side. You can see the lightning flashing there in the sky. If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.